Hello and welcome back to our channel, Beyond the Light. Also welcome to our new viewers and listeners joining us today. We're thrilled to have each and every one of you here. Today we have received an amazing story of Mark. Mark experienced the house of the Lord in heaven and reached out to tell us his story. Sit back, have a cup of coffee or tea, and enjoy today's experience. Once again, welcome to our channel and enjoy. Somewhere about mid-May, 2004 life, as I knew it, I had begun a spiral downhill fast. I found myself frustrated, as I had begun about a month before, unable to think properly, and getting lost going places I knew well. The family doctor sent me to tests and a number of specialists. They all saw something, but nothing definitive. A vascular surgeon recommended I see a cardiologist. The cardiologist said we need to take a look inside, but your symptoms suggest a little heart problem. You should see a neurologist. Take this medication, though, when you experience pain, until we can schedule a look inside that heart. Good enough. Saw the neurologist that week, had the pains in the chest a couple of times, took the medication. Neurologist said, looks okay. Go see your endocrinologist, get that thyroid under control, and in six months you'll feel perfect. But I'll order an electroencephalogram and a scan just to be safe well before safe could be ruled out, and they could get a good look inside that heart. May 27th, around noon. My world crashed. The feeling in my head was indescribable, as if someone slit my throat and all the blood ran out, only there was no blood. When my ability to see and think returned, so did the pain in my back and chest up to my shoulder blade. Okay, I'm dying here. I had enough sense to go outside, sit down and call 911. Help! Please help. I think I'm having a heart attack. They arrived five minutes later, hooked me up to the monitors and such. Nope. We'll take you to the hospital. Doesn't look like a heart attack, though. At the hospital, I was placed in a chair in the waiting room. Here, fill out these forms, and we'll call you. A nurse came in the room and said, Hi, Mark. Let me see the forms. Well, I would if I could. I am having a hard time moving. The nurse, my wife and I with their assistance, led me to the triage room. They were looking at me funny. Smile for me, said the nurse. I complied. Raise your eyebrows for me. Squeeze my hands with yours. They were looking at me so funny. I asked my wife what's wrong with me. They both answered. No, I don't want to hear this. You've had a stroke on your left side. My heart pain was nothing to the feeling I had. Tears began to run from my eyes. My God. What is happening to me? They admitted me to the coronary care unit and monitored me, gave me blood thinners and heart medications and something for the chest pain. Okay. Well, it's nighttime and they have stopped the pain. I'm not dead and just weak on the left side. A neurologist had been called in, confirmed the diagnosis and ordered tests. He said he had called the cardiologist because they didn't like the heartbeat. Cardiologist showed up next morning well, you've had a stroke, you're going to be all right. We are going to do an angiogram on the first of the month just to check it out, after the holiday. On June 1st, I was feeling better and eating okay. I didn't fear the angiogram. In the morning, they came and got me ready for the procedure. Took me downstairs to the lab. Started the procedure. My wife would see me after in the recovery area. Just smashing. Little pain during the procedure and after in recovery. My wife was there and everything was fine. The doctor who did the angiogram came and told me, There is a problem with the right coronary artery. We will fix it tomorrow. We will transfer you to the main hospital just for safety in the morning. You will be just fine. Okay, okay. Now I'm a little scared, but okay. I had the documents done when I knew before the stroke that the procedures had some risk. So I had a power of attorney done for my wife just in case. I said my prayers that night for Jesus to be there and guide them consult for them. I had seen the pastor of the church I was going to and asked him to pray for me also. I was ready. Everything was going to be just fine. On the morning of June 2nd, I was anxious to be transferred to the main hospital. The transportation team was running a little behind. I was supposed to be in the procedure at 10.30 a.m. Long and short, I got there at 10.30. My wife was there and saw me. We talked. If something should happen, you have the paperwork? Everything will be okay. I'll be in recovery when you get there. 
The nurses came to get me at about 11 a.m. They told my wife where to wait, and they would inform her when I was finished. They took me into the suite and started to set it up for the cardiologist. They draped me, set up the local anesthesia, and turned on the doctor's favorite music. Classical. Enter the doctor, starting the procedure. Administer the local insertion of the catheter. I listened intently to the conversations between the others in the room and the doctor. They told my wife about an hour to an hour and a half. An hour, an hour and a half going on two, the camera is moving and I feel the pressure in my chest. I hear them talking about the stent and the pressures required for the catheter. Suddenly I hear from the doctor's mouth something that was a very undoctorly thing to say. Oh shit! I think, oh shit, what? All of a sudden the sound of people talking stopped and the voices were now coming from the back of the lab, where the computers are located. I hear furious talking from a distance. Is that a clot? Not sure? Is it? Don't know! Then the feeling of heavy pressure in my chest, I moaned, a voice from the other side of the table. Are you in pain? No, just a lot of pressure. The pressure should go away. As I felt something cold enter my arm. Another voice in the room. Did you give him the morphine? Ahoo! replied the other voice. The equipment, the monitors, and shields were pulled back and the lights came on. I thought this is big trouble. When I heard the cardiologist ask someone in the room, should I remove the catheter or leave it inflated? A voice answered, leave it in, I'll take it out when I'm finished. Then there was this man whom I had never seen before looking down at me. He looked pleasant and reassuring. He introduced himself and said, I don't have time to explain what happened, but something went wrong. I'm going to take you to open heart surgery. We'll take care of you. We'll get the authorization from your wife. If frightened was the word, then I was so frightened that the only thing I could think of was pray for them to have the Lord in there with them, whoever them is. My wife came in and I saw the doctor. This time he was in scrubs. My wife held my hand and the doctor said, We'll do our best. See you after you recover. My wife and I said what I thought would be my last goodbye to someone I loved so much. As they wheeled me down the hall toward the elevator, the anesthesiologist looked down at me and said, you'll be asleep before we get there. That was the last thing I heard until I woke on a ventilator with a myriad of tubes and wires. My wife was there. She held my hand and spoke softly. You're going to be all right, honey, it's all right. There were all kinds of people, nurses, doctors, technicians, checking, wiping, injecting. I knew something serious had happened. I had blood hanging and my chest felt as though I had jumped from the 10th floor of a building, landing on my breastbone. In the past seven days, I'd had a stroke, angiogram, failed angioplasty, open heart surgery, lots of blood loss, I learned later. I learned that the artery had blown out. The only thing that stopped me from bleeding to death was the wise decision to leave the catheter blown up in place. I learned that the mild to moderate heart condition that I knew I had was more than moderate, and that being on the heart-lung machine for a long time had done more damage. Terrific. All that and now I am in pain, I can hardly breathe. I'm dizzy, and my blood pressure is dropping like a rock. What else could go wrong? Remember be careful what you pray for. As I was recovering from the last assault on my body, things were looking up. I was able to walk a little, sit in a chair next to the bed for an hour or so. I was starting to taste food again, and I prayed constantly. Thank you, Lord, for allowing me to stay to do whatever it was you wanted me to do for you, even though I still don't know exactly what it is you want of me. But thank you for the lesson learned. It's now the 5th of June, and the surgeon and the other doctors are talking of going home in a day or so. Wow, doing well. Still hard to get around, I am so weak. It took me over two hours to wash myself from a chair next to the sink, but it was looking up. They pulled the chest tubes as I was no longer bleeding internally and possibly a shower today. The doctor came in mid-morning and said, We are thinking of cutting you loose this afternoon, but we may hang on to you for another day or so because your blood pressure keeps dropping. We're going to check your meds and adjust that, just a day or so. I was still in thankful prayer mode and so happy when my family came to visit. It was like being reborn. The 6th of June and I was ready for resting at home and getting down to what God wanted me to do. I was sure I would find it and do what he wanted.
I woke early on the 7th. I was a little restless about 6 a.m. The nursing staff would change over at 7 o'clock. Won't see a nurse or anything until after 7.30. I was actually waiting for hospital food to come. I was hungry. What would breakfast be? I couldn't remember what I had ordered. Didn't matter, just wanted to eat. A little after 7 o'clock, I was sitting on the side of the bed, watching television. I had just gone to the bathroom, still sitting, waiting for food. Started to feel heavy in my jaws. Kept removing my glasses, rubbing my jaw. Thought, man, this may become a headache or something. Nothing some food won't help. I heard the food trays come off the elevator and went wild with anticipation. It was 7.30 or so and I was thinking of food and going home that day. I had even planned to call my wife to pick me up this afternoon. In less than one minute, I would embark on the most amazing journey I had ever been on. I felt a sudden sense of doom. I felt as though no blood was flowing, no pain. Within seconds, all I could get out was, Help me! Please help me! God help! Now I was no longer in a hospital room, but on a road. Not a golden road, just a beautiful road. It was me. I saw. A young me, about ten years old or so, with a long willow branch over my shoulder, and a red bandana at the end of the branch, like a hobo. There were people that I had known in my life, and many others that I did not on that road. We exchanged smiles as we passed, and my mind was in awe of what I was seeing. The most beautiful road I had ever seen. Details that were indescribable. Suddenly I thought of a mountain I had seen as a child. When I looked up from the road, there it was. The mountain. Not just the mountain, but the most breathtaking mountain I had ever seen. Details the likes of which no one could imagine. Colors, shades of color, shadows for which there are no words in the human language to describe. All that I saw and felt was as if something was filling my mind with answers before I could even ask the question. The presence of God was in all things. It was as though the promise of being filled and overflowing. What your soul desired to see was filled at that very moment. Everything that your soul needed was met before it could be asked. There is no distance here, so time does not exist. What your soul desires it is. All you desire to know is done. You are filled with the Spirit, and you know it. I had never experienced such a feeling of satisfaction in my life. I had come to my Lord, in the most perfect place, and I had been accepted by my God in His house. How wonderful is that? I felt as though I had come home, from perfection to be born into sin, live in imperfection, never fully understanding the wonder of God, and then finding yourself at His door as He welcomes you in. Then a voice seemingly from nowhere, yet everywhere said, Mark, you must go back. Go back! No! No! I can't go back! Again the voice said, You must return. I have given you a task. You have not finished. No, no, please God, no! Let me stay! With lightning speed, I was naked moving backwards through the darkest of darkness. There were lightning bolts all about me, from my feet to the top of my head. Enormous lightning bolts, going in all directions into the darkness, despite the brightness of the lightning. The light from it did not penetrate the awful darkness. Suddenly my eyes popped open, my right arm flailing wildly. I was mouthing, No, please stop doing this! Stop, let me go! I looked forward and saw what appeared to be a stadium full of people all looking at me and cheering those around me to save me. The noise was incredible, everyone talking shouting out numbers, and directing others. Then to my left, someone took my hand and held it. I looked up and saw a young woman. She was looking into my eyes, past them to my very soul. The noise subsided so that all I could hear was the sound of her voice. Her eyes never left the depth of my soul. Her voice was like that of an angel. As she spoke, It is not your choice now. It is his now. I stopped fighting. No more flailing my arms, no more declarations from my mouth. I heard in the distance a nurse say, Clear! The sound of a machine beeping, and a loud hum. The last thing I remembered until fifteen hours later. Why had my God returned me? Did he send this young woman to assist me in doing his will? Was she there to help me back to this world? I believe so. He kept his promise. Now I must keep mine. When I awoke after this incredible journey, respirator removed. I could sense the spiritual nature of my body had changed. 
As I opened my eyes for the first time since this journey began over 15 hours ago, it became obvious these eyes were no longer seeing with the mind, but as if my soul were peering out onto the world. Everything had meaning, deeper than I had ever cared to look before. All things had importance, the words I spoke, the way I gestured, my facial reactions. When I smiled, it was from the heart. When I cried, they were tears from my heart, tears of gratefulness. As weak as I was, it was hard to breathe. Every breath was an effort, and the pain all over my body was intractable. Yet my heart was so grateful for the experience. Just to live for God's purpose gave meaning to every pain, every breath. It was as though God filled my lungs with His own breath, each time I needed air. Every word I spoke felt as though God wrote it, and I was reading the text. My thoughts were no longer my own, nor about myself but rather everyone I came in contact with became the center of my being. Everyone else became important and what I said to them. I spoke with the two male nurses that cared for me that night and what I had experienced. I explained to them about a woman I believed was a nurse. I did not know her name, but I could describe her. I told them that she appeared on my left side that day and I would like to thank her personally for helping me. One of them said, the way you described her, it sounds like Debbie, and she worked that morning. When I see her, I'll ask. Two days later, mid-morning in intensive coronary care unit, a knock on the door to my room. Come in, I said. The door opened slowly. A young woman entered my room. I said, you are Debbie, aren't you? Yes, she said as she once again came to my left side. She said as she held my hand in hers, I'm so happy to see you doing so well after what you went through. I once again looked into her eyes. Again, she was looking deep into my soul. I said, Thank you. Thank you. You made it possible for me to return to this life. I continued, I did not want to come back, you know. You made it possible. God placed you there at just that time. Even the words you said to me, God sent an angel, you to help me, to return to this world. The tears of my heart and the gratefulness showed in my eyes. I could see the Spirit of the Lord within her. It brought to mind immediately a Bible verse, repeating over and over in my mind, I will never leave you alone. I will send an angel ahead to prepare a place for you. And my own father's favorite verse, I go now to prepare a place for you, for in my father's mansion there are many rooms. All of this now made perfect sense to me. I was in God's house, but my room was not yet ready for me. So my father sent me on an errand while he finished my room. Do angels exist? I wasn't quite sure. Now I not only know they exist, they are constantly in our presence. Every time I see that look, the soul looking out displayed in their eyes for all to see, all I can do is to kneel before them and give thanks. Thank you so much for your presence, Lord, in this being's soul. The 10th of June now I am getting around and must be monitored all the time. The doctors are discussing placing a defibrillator in my chest to prevent sudden cardiac death from occurring again. The 14th, the night before they install the device. The doctor explained to me the risk involved. To test the device, they would have to stop my heart twice and let the device shock me to make sure it would work. I washed up at the sink and shaved. While I was doing so, I was praying for all those who would be involved in the surgery the next day. Suddenly, I looked into the mirror in front of me. I looked close again. Who is in there? Who is now inside me? The eyes looking back at me were no longer the mark that I knew. I asked aloud to the eyes looking back at me, Who are you? A gentle voice replied, It is the new mark. The old one no longer exists. I said, Good Lord, what do you want of me? Again a quiet voice replied, You need to love more. You need to accept love more. Be forgiving more. Keep in mind what you were privileged to see, a world that few would remember. Most important, love is the answer. I was in disbelief. Tears were flowing from my eyes, and I kept praising over and over, Thank you for the new me. Oh, thank you. My eyes are now opened. The meaning of the line in the church song, Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, I want to see you. Now that understanding has torn through me like a piece of shrapnel, I now see through the eyes of my heart, not just the ones in my head. I have seen the Lord. 
I realized that I had seen him so many times in my youth. He had shown me so many things on the earth that are as it is in heaven. Yet I only saw what the eyes in my head could see. I now understand that the Bible said that in the beginning. The heaven and the earth were created with perfection. Man was placed in the perfect place on earth to have all that was perfect. Our ancestors disobeyed and the earth was made imperfect. When we pass from this life of imperfection to the next, God is always asking the question of us, all of our lives, are you ready? Your ancestors had perfection, but they were not ready for it then, so I ask you now, are you ready? I had to die in order to understand that concept. God was asking me and trying to show me the way, but I chose the human way. My way was the better way. The death of my body was so peaceful, so wonderful. Let me assure you the trip back was anything but easy. I was so frightened that the darkness that I was being drawn through and the accompanying pain was my rejection from the perfect life everlasting straight to my place in hell. Please learn now. Understand the grace of God before you pass on. Some only learn the hard way. Some can only understand when that relationship is threatened with being withdrawn. Open the eyes of your heart. Let those eyes see the grace and the power of I am. Believe that He is. Believe that He has prepared a place for you that is without pain, suffering, and the constraints of the human condition. No distance, no time, as your soul desires, so it is. That which the soul desires to see is seen. Seen in ways that we cannot imagine, understanding all that is present instantly. Feeling that your God is in everything, forever. He lives with you in His perfection for all time. As I said earlier, I had to die to understand what a friend I had, how important his friendship and love were. His advice is right. We only need to ask and then be willing to listen. Sometime God shouts. Most of the time he whispers, why do we only listen when he shouts? It has been five months since I left the hospital on June 17th. Much has happened to me since that time. I've been in contact with my daughter and my grandchildren other members of my family that I had not seen for a long while. I was able to meet with all of them and see them, spend joyful times with them. My family and I weathered three hurricanes and the damage they caused. We lived for a few weeks without conveniences. We had our moments, but the important thing is, we had each other. As of this time, I do not know if this writing will be continued. I have much more to say, but I leave it now and allow God's will to be done. I have endured pain pleasure, insult, and injury. Yet that is just the point. God has given me all of this for His reasons, not mine. Should He grant me more time on this earth, I will endeavor to continue His work. And that's for today's inspiring story. We hope you were moved by Mark's story of transformation. Make sure to leave your thoughts and experiences in the comments down below. Did this story inspire you? Have you had any encounters that have touched your life in a profound way? Let's keep the conversation going. Your words might just be the inspiration someone else needs. We want to express our gratitude to each and every one of you for joining us today. We wouldn't be here without your support and enthusiasm. That is what keeps us going, bringing these incredible stories to light. We hope to see you again next video as we delve into another experience that will leave you inspired and uplifted. Make sure to like and subscribe to our channel to never miss a new experience. Until then, keep shining your light and remember, there's always hope beyond the darkness. Thank you and see you in the next video.